learning a world model of other humans, other human drivers, pedestrian, cyclists' behavior gives them a much better ability to build a driving AI. So absolutely、mm-hmm. makes sense. Like the same idea of understanding the environment through a lot of data, so that you can better anticipate like what actions you should take, also makes sense in. Our robotics world, like in particular robotic manipulation world. So, like in robotics, inference, cost, and speed are very important. In robotics, like you need your robots to be acting all the time. Like that means like you have to really optimize your AI models to give output very quickly, and and so that robots can take actions continuously. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost. Of other clouds, if you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, Eight by Eight, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com/ionai. That's E Y E O N A I all run together. Oracle.com/ionai. That's oracle.com. Slash I on AI. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is I on AI. In today's episode, we delve deep into the world of AI and robotics with Peter Chen, co-founder and CEO of Covariant, an industrial AI robotics company. Peter talks about building a universal foundation model that can operate different kinds of industrial robots. Across three continents, we also discuss the role of world models in predicting the outcomes of actions and their potential to generalize across various robotic applications. Whether it's navigating the complexities of warehouse automation or envisioning the future of robotics, Peter's insights are as transformative as the technology he's helping to create. I hope you find the conversation as engrossing as I did. Craig, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Peter Chen. I'm one of the co-founders as well as CEO of Covariant, a company that is focused on building foundation model for robotics.、Uh, a bit of a personal history about myself: I was born and raised in China.、Uh, I got into programming and computer science、uh, in a very young age,、uh, and. It always fascinates me, like how much intelligence you can get by programming software, like which is basically instructing a computer to act intelligently.、Um, but there's always something like left,、um, like what if the com- computers can learn from data, like as opposed to like you have to instruct every single bit of the intelligence rule. Like so, that's what got me into、um, PhD after my undergrad at UC Berkeley. I started my PhD、um, in AI with Professor Peter Bill at UC Berkeley, focusing on two areas、um, that have both become extremely hot today. One area is reinforcement learning, like the art of having machine learning models produce actions, and some of these actions lead to good consequences. Some of these actions lead to bad consequences. How can you have models learn from like its own? Mistakes and successes, right? So that's reinforcement learning.、Uh, another area of my PhD focus was generative models.、Um, so my PhD advisor and I、um, actually co-created and co-taught the first graduate level generative AI class at Berkeley、um, back in like 2017, 2018, a long time ago.、Um, and Um, like obviously, we have seen like how those fields have really taken off、um, in the last couple of years, and those ideas that were 
once very academic, uh, cutting edge, and unproven, have become a lot more commonplace concept um, that people interact with, right? Like if you go to ChatGPT, like it is both a generative model and a model that is aligned by reinforcement learning. Um, so it's amazing to see that arc of transformation of something that was cutting edge, unproven ideas to something that now is everyday and is still continuing to accelerate the AI's development. Another bit of my personal background was I also spent time early on at OpenAI. I joined OpenAI fairly early uh, when I started working out uh, at OpenAI. OpenAI didn't even have an office. We were working out of Greg Brockman's apartment at the time. Um, and um, obviously OpenAI has done amazingly well and have like really powered a lot of the AI revolution that we are seeing today. Um, but maybe the thing that I want to call out that was su that's super interesting to me, especially as I reflect back is like some of the core philosophies that OpenAI started out with um, are really the same set of philosophies that are powering like the success of OpenAI that we are seeing today, right? It's like, so if I were to summarize the early research philosophies at OpenAI in its like first one or two years of existence as a company, like it was this belief of a foundation model, scaling up big model on large diverse data sets, um, this belief in generative model, using generative model to absorb a lot of unlabeled data, unstructured data. Uh, and third is reinforcement learning, like this ability to teach um, agents or models the ability to take actions in the world. Um, those philosophies like heavily influence me uh, and heavily influence what we do at Covarian. Um, and also it's the same driving forces of what power OpenAI success today. Fast forward to how we founded Covarian. So, um, um, a couple of the founders, uh, co-founders at Covariant left OpenAI in late 2017 to start Covariant. We started Covariant really with much of the same um, thesis of what powers the current success of large language model. Like we believe in single model, like we believe in single large model that is a foundation model, like which means it's a model that is trained on multiple type of tasks. It can leverage the transfer learnings across multiple kinds of tasks and have emergent behavior. Um, and so it generalized to new tasks better, but it also perform better at like any specific task than um, a bespoke model that is only trained on that task. And we had an incredibly strong conviction that this foundation model for robotics um, has to be the way to go to solve robotics problems. Um, because like, obviously we have seen the success of this foundation model approach for language, but the reason that it makes even more sense for robotics is that there's only one physical world, right? Unlike in the language, like where you're trying to compress um, the whole world of human knowledge, which includes many things that have nothing in common with each other. Like what is the soil composition on the moon versus how do you play chess? Okay, like both of these are knowledge that you can find on the internet, but they have absolutely nothing in common um, with each other. And you're trying to compress all of these things into one model. But if you think about building a foundation model for robotics, like the robot could have different bodies, like, and the robots might be doing different things. Like it might be interacting in different kinds of environments. However, like all of these robots live and operate in the same physical world, right? And so it makes a lot of sense to build one foundation model that can learn from all of these different robot experience and really understand physics and understand how do you control robots to move um, in the world around us. So that was a little bit of the founding story of Covarian. Uh, and fast forward to today, Covarian has commercialized um, the first robotic foundation model that's ever built. Like So essentially one single model that is powering robots um, working in production in customer environments in three different continents, um, dozens of different robot hardware bodies, that same single foundation model is powering and solving problems in a lot of different industries. Um, we're starting out from um, warehouses, um, but our long-term goal is to build this foundation model that can solve robotic manipulation problems um, in general, like across a multiple of other industries. So that's a Quick introduction about myself, where I come from, like the, the philosophies and the technical ideas that have heavily influenced us uh, and where we have taken it so far.
Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One, when you were doing the uh, the first course on generative AI at Berkeley, uh, was that in response to the development of the transformer algorithm, or did you integrate the transformer algorithm into that course? Because that uh, has really accelerated and is today the 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 core of generative AI. Yeah, I would say um, transformer was not a key focus of that course. Like, so when we think about um, generative AI, there are you can think about it as like the two major components of it, right? Like, so one major component is what is the model architecture, right? Like, so that is the mm -hmm. um, like how is your brain structure, like like so like obviously a better brain structure can allow you to learn. Better, right, and so transformer is a really flexible brain structure mm -hmm. that can allow you to absorb a lot of knowledge um, patterns from the data. Uh, there's another side of um, how do you train a generative model that is the like how do you teach it, right? Like so, even if you have a very flexible brain structure, like how do you how do you actually give it that learning? Like think of it as the the curriculum teaching methods. Like so, in this case, like it would be the statistical models that you use, like different versions of it would be the most popular one now obviously is diffusion auto regressive model of next token prediction um, and then like a little bit earlier ago like there will be GANs VAEs and these different models that are like the statistical representation like the statistical representations that you impose on the world like which you can see as like methods of how you teach um, the models so I would say like the initial class focused more on like what are the different statistical models that you could use um, as a much like as opposed to a more focus on like what is the underlying brain structure like but you can like swap and 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 plug in with these kind of things like right? so for example the idea of diffusion like you can implement diffusion um, with both a convolutional neural nets you could implement it with a transformer based architecture and like obviously the currently the more popular one like stable diffusion is implemented with a combination of convolutional neural nets as well as transformers so you can take really the best of both worlds yeah the current um uh, i mean there's been a lot of uh talk at least in in the literature in the last few months about using uh, large models, large language models, or pre-trained uh, transformer models uh, as agents. And, and then more recently, you and I spoke about this the other day, uh, Jan LeCun and, and Alex Kendall at a company called Wave AI are working uh, with world models and uh, you know that that learn causality directly from uh, sensory inputs uh, not through the filter of language and that world model idea speaks to me uh, because it it seems much closer uh, to how the brain learns initially uh, in 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 the covariant foundational model, can you talk about the the architecture and how it's how it works? I know that it's certainly proprietary, but uh, and then talk about these new developments with large language models and world models, and whether you're integrating those ideas or or. Uh, whether you see promise in them? Yeah, so um, those are really good questions. Uh, maybe we would tackle them separately, like kind of the idea of um, role model and then also the idea of agents in the language world. Um, so yeah. first of all, like this idea of learning a role model for any kind of what we call embodied agents um, makes a lot of sense, right? Like, so like if you, if the goal of an agent is to understand the physical world and take actions in it and your actions have consequences, um, then you should have understanding of what that consequences are, right? As opposed to just blindly yeah. trying things and say, oh yeah, pushing button A is better than pushing button B. Well, well that's a, I mean, that kind of works if you have a lot of data, but that's kind of like a very naive understanding of the world. Like if I, 
I push a lot of button A, it tends to give me better outcome than pushing button B. Okay, then I do pushing button A more. That's kind of like not a very sophisticated understanding of the world. And it's also not very generalizable. Like what if I, like instead of presenting button A and B to you, I give you a keyboard and you need to type in like pass key and it does different things. Um, you really cannot take any of the learnings that you get from, oh, pushing button A is better. Like if now you suddenly have a different way of interacting in the world. And so the idea, like the general idea of building a um, role model is, can we, can we build agents that really understand the environment and have the ability to anticipate what are the consequences of the actions um, that it takes? Um, and this idea has many different incarnations, like um, with how, what Alex and the team is doing at Wave, uh, a lot of it is about anticipating other agents' behavior, right? Like if you drive a car, mm -hmm. like slowly edging it to a pedestrian, like most often the, like people would try to uh, um, step away from the car if they notice the car is approaching them. And if they don't step away, like that means like maybe they didn't notice that the car is approaching them. So there's like some interesting interaction that you can learn by anticipating um, other agents' behavior in the physical world, like which is absolutely the most core problem to solve in self-driving is like this kind of multi-agent interaction and the behavior that you um, need to generate from there. And so by learning a role model of other humans, other human drivers, pedestrian, cyclists behavior gives them a much better ability to build um, a driving AI. So absolutely mm -hmm. makes sense. And the same idea, like the same idea of understanding the environment through a lot of data so that you can better anticipate like what actions you should take also makes sense in our robotics world, like in particular robotic manipulation world. So like, so in our case, like the world that you're learning is not another human being's, uh, uh, what's in another human being's eye, mind, but it's more like what happens to physics. Like if I pick things up in different ways, like what is more stable, what is less stable? Like if I pull, if right. I like throw things away in a certain manner, like where would it land if I want to carefully tuck things together? And so like, again, like you have two ways that you can build this AI. Like one way they can build this AI is I just do a lot of blind random trial and I see what happens to work and I just keep doing that. Or you could actually learn a sophisticated understanding of, okay, like if I pick things up this way, this is a pretty stable way of grasping a certain item. If I pick things up another way, oh, wow, this is a very unstable, very precarious way of picking up an item. But um, I can, by anticipating what would happen in the physical world, like it gives the AI a much better ability um, to act in it. So we are a strong believer in this idea of a role model, like essentially this AI that can learn um, um, uh, about the environment and also anticipate what would happen to it. And then like another thing that um, it's, it's not just a more, like you said, it's not just a more sensible way for an intelligent entity to learn because that's like more of like how human would learn. You don't just randomly try, you anticipate like how things, um, what would be the consequence of the action that you take. But in addition to that, like there was a really amazing property about role model um, that we believe is under talked about. And which is this idea that if you formulate the right role model that unified all robotic applications, right? So like you could have like, for example, like if you think about like um, uh, uh, a robot that is folding laundry as opposed to like versus a robot that is uh, packing a customer order in a warehouse, like mm -hmm. at a service level, like there's kind of nothing in common with these two um, robots. Like one robot is trying to carefully think about, okay, like how do I pick up a deformable piece of a t-shirt and how do I flatten it and how do I fold it? Uh, another robot in a warehouse would be thinking about, well, I need to pick up the item and I need to find where the barcode is and I need to scan the barcode. Like from a policy or from an action perspective, there's really nothing in common between these two robots. Mm -hmm. But what is in common about them is there's only one physical world that's powering them, right? Like, so if you're learning a world model that understands if I interact with the world in a certain way, what would happen in the next few seconds physically? Like that concept is universal, right? And so like what, this is like, what makes this world model idea so powerful? Like is it gives you this formulation um, or quite like an interface 
that is the same across all robots. Like no matter what kind of tasks they are doing, no matter what kinds of hardware they are using, um, it's the same. Like it's the same role model because there's only one physical world. Like now suddenly you find a way to really scale up the data that can go into training a robotic foundation model, right? Like for all of these foundation models, like one of the, like obviously you need the right model, you need the right algorithm, but you also need a lot of data of the right kind, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so the role model actually opens up the possibility of training large foundation model that's learning on a lot of data, because now you can pull the data from many different robots together, right? And, mm -hmm. and like, it doesn't matter what kind of tasks they are doing and, uh, and the environment that they're interacting, like there's the same set of physical principles behind them. Like, and that's what um, the model can learn. And, and the initial training, uh, that's sort of the ongoing training, but the initial training, uh, you, you can simply train from a video. Is that right? Um, uh, that, that, that shows the laws of physics or, you know, causality and that sort of thing. Uh, and, yeah. and then, uh, yeah, then, uh, it, there's ongoing training as the network computers learn. Yeah, so um, we believe video is a super important um, format for this. Like, how can you, like, there's just so much uh, data that's encoded in video. Um, but what we have found is that pure video is also not sufficient. Like, for example, like, if you just go to YouTube and just watch a whole bunch of videos, um, you only get a very partial view uh, of the world. Like, so there are, like, let me just point out, like, two things that are missing uh, in in like, what if I just go to YouTube and watch a lot of video? Like the first thing that is missing is, um, in a lot of the cases, you don't really know what are the actions that are taken, um, like, because you're just passively observing um, um, things. And so you don't really know, like, what are the actions that, that are taken? Uh, and then the second thing is like, in a lot of these um, videos out there, um, you also don't have a very detailed, um, it also lacks the very small details that are really important um, to robotics. Like, so for example, like what is the actual velocity of a certain thing, like down to a very fine degree of precision, like well, that information is kind of hard to infer from a video, like, but if you are controlling a full robot systems, like you actually can get it maybe from the motor encoder, like you can get the information in a lot more precise way. Uh, and in a lot of the, in a lot of robotics cases, like you do need a pretty precise understanding of the world that the video doesn't fully communicate. Like, mm -hmm. so both the lack of understanding of what were the actions that were taken in videos, as well as the position that is required, makes this, um, like kind of what we call videos in the wild, a useful source of data, um, but it's definitely not um, a sufficient um, set of data. Mm -hmm. And and then where do you get, uh, is is that why that uh, data is uh, supplemented with uh, data from robots operating in different scenarios or, or are there other kinds of data? Can you use synthetic data, for example? Yeah, so um, let me maybe answer the the broader question, right? So when we think about like, how do you build a robotic foundation model, like a truly universal AI that can be powering any robot hardware to do any arbitrary things to a very high level of autonomy. Like we believe the data recipe for that um, are three pillars. Like the first pillar is what we talk about, like essentially data on the internet, like so video data, image data on the internet. Second thing that, um, second thing about it is synthetic data, like um, generative data that are not, uh, may, they may not look exactly like the real world, but they contain useful structure about the world that can teach um, the AI. And you can get um, lots of interesting uh, combinations of known factors or variations through simulation, um, through this, this kind of synthetic data. Like we believe that's very important. But these two things, like these like kind of data in the wild on the internet and synthetic data are both very useful learning sources, but in our experience, they are not sufficient. Like they, they still lack the kind of actual detailed interaction with the world, like understanding cause and effects, understanding them to a very high degree of fidelity. Um, 
like those are not present in these two data sets um, that we talk about. Like um, to give an example of like where the synthetic data break down, uh, it's very difficult to simulate contact and anything that deforms. Uh, and so those are the mm -hmm. kind of places that like, okay, I can use simulate, simulated data to simulate something that's rigid or maybe it doesn't involve a lot of contact. But as soon as you involve that, like your simulations quality or the precision of it uh, would quickly decrease. Uh, so in the end of the day, like we, what we have found is that the third bucket of the data that you need um, is robots interacting with objects in the real world at scale. Like, so like these are like the three data buckets that um, go into mm -hmm. training a robotic foundation models. Like so data on the internet, on the, in the wild, synthetic data, um, and then large volume of robotics data interacting with the real world uh, in production. And, and this is really the core focus of Covariant ever since we started the company. Like we strongly believe in the idea that um, um, in order to build the best robot AI, you need to have the most amount of robotics data that are the highest quality, like, which is why we really focus on one, solving customer problems, like making sure we build a technology that is not just interesting lab demo, but it's something that actually works reliably 24 seven in an industrial environment. Mm -hmm. And the robots are so reliable, so autonomous and deliver at such a level of throughput that um, our, our customers' facilities just completely depend on them. And once you have that, like you have robots out there that are generating data at an incredible rate, right? Because like we are deploying these type of robots into industrial warehouse facilities that process amazing volume, right? So once you actually make these systems generate commercial value, you can collect tremendous amount of data while you um, um, generate value for your customers. So that's being very customer value focused, being very production deployment focused. It's like one mm -hmm. thing that um, we have really focused on as a company. Uh, the second thing that we really focus on as a company is collecting the right kind of data. Like, so it's not just about, oh, get the robots out there. And then like, as they get used 24 seven, a lot of data gets generated. We also spend a lot of time thinking about like, what is exactly the right kind of data that you need to collect from the fleet of robots um, out there so that you can actually enable learning. Uh, and there are lots of deep research thinking and iterations that go into it. And it's still something that we are obviously very actively iterating on. Yeah. Uh, and the, the architecture of your, of your, uh, world of your foundation model, uh, is, is it, um, uh, uh is it like a JEPA architecture that Yan LeCun talks about where, uh, the model is encoding uh, the data into a higher representation space and then operating in that space to make predictions or, or, or is it uh, more along the lines of, uh, you know, a, a generative pre-trained transformer model where everything's being tokenized and you're you're predicting the next in a series uh, well i guess that wouldn't be a world model but when do you combine these things yeah um there are there are definitely different schools of thoughts on how do you represent this type of thing like one uh one way to do it is like you can say like there's some explicit latent representation of the world that I learn and is in that some kind of latent description of the world that I learn to predict, I learn causality. Um, there's another version of the world, like, which is, um, if you think about, um, a large language model, like that is just transformer looking at all the previous words. And I predict the next word, like there's never an explicit representation of a latent structure somewhere, right? Like there's not saying, oh. I encode all of my previous words into like some latent space and I decode the next word from it. Uh, but instead, like you just have this large structure that looks at everything that you have seen uh, and then auto aggressively predict the next one. Um, I wouldn't say, 
I don't. I think the jury is still out in terms of which one will be a more likely um, successful structure,、um, and we can probably draw some biological inspiration, or maybe draw some inspiration from how we work. Like, and you say, well, like it seems more efficient to operate in some kind of latent space, like because like then you're operating in this,、um, you're reasoning about the world in a more abstract way as opposed to well looking at every single pixels and then trying to think about like what should the next pixel be. Um, I would say like both are avenues that we look at,、um, but we don't believe there's like a one clear winner、uh, at this moment. But you you have a foundation model in operation. So what's the what's the the architecture? Can you describe how that foundation model works? Whether it's transformer based. Yeah, just. So I think there are really two questions in there. Like one is like what does role like what does role model look like, and like what does the other parts of foundation models like and the specific architectures that are used there.、Um, so the specific role model that we have,、um, I would say it's more similar to the. Latent type of representation, like there's a more compact, more abstract representation of the world、um, that's operating on,、um, and、um, and we believe like that likely would continue to be the case, like just because like operating in pure pixels of images and videos,、um, it's a pretty wasteful representation to look at. Like like when you think about, oh, if I don't grab something in a stable way and then it drops, like you in your head you don't try to predict. Where each pixel would go, right? Like you have this high-level notion of oh, something would drop、um, from it. So we think like likely that would be、um, would be more successful, but we are pretty open-minded about it. In terms of the second question of like what are the specific model architectures that are used in um, um, our foundation models? It's a pretty wide set of. Architectures. It's not a pure transformer-based architecture. Like so, it's not all attention blocks、um, throughout. Like it's a combination of, it's a combination of convolution attention,、um, and in some places, more structured type of attention, like、um, graphical neural nets, like for specific places that it makes sense.、Um, so,、uh, I would say like the key insight there is in robotics. Inference, cost, and speed are very important, right? Because unlike in a maybe a different、um, world, like where it's okay for my like next sentence prediction to be a little bit slow, in robotics, like you need your robots to be acting all the time. Like that means like you have to really optimize your AI models to give output very quickly, and and so the robots can take actions continuously. Uh, and because of that, like we spend a lot of work on not just blindly following the biggest, most expressive architecture, but really trying to use the domain understandings that we have about robotics and really optimize the architecture to be more latency sensitive, like to be more compute budget sensitive. And and、um, you you have to adapt. This model to whatever hardware it's running on, and we talked before about the hardware constraints in robotics.、Uh, does the, does the world model、uh, your foundation model? Does it、uh, for each、uh, specific robot that it's controlling? The robot has a goal. Or a policy, and does the、uh, does the model have to take into account the the hardware configuration certainly. and certainly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, think about、um, think about in the large language model worlds, it's very common to use、um, system prompts to configure. The character, the tone, or like the styles of a、um, language agent, right? Like in in our world, like you would use 
think of it as the equivalence of prompting um, to basically instruct a robotic foundation models to know well, what kind of hardware am I using, right? And what are the things that I can I can do with my current hardware body? Like, so think of it as like one base model, but then on top of that, like you add configurations or prompting that actually instruct the model on, okay, like you're now using this kind of hardware body and like this is what you should do uh, with it. Is, is uh, you've been working with these, uh, this this foundation model is is as a world model uh since the founding of covariant uh, has the research moved uh significantly from when you started excuse me from when you started oh, uh, for, for example yeah i'm i'm reading a lot now about uh llm based agents and and all of this world model I've followed, uh, Jan LeCun's research, and it's really progressed a lot. Certainly, um, like um, yeah. th there are there are many things that are accelerating at a very fast rate. Right, one core thing is compute. Um, like when mm -hmm. we when we started six years ago, like the amount of compute that you could have access to is very different from the amount of compute that you can have access to today. Right, so as compute availability. Um, goes up. You can train bigger model that have more expressivity. Uh, and then the second thing is data scale, right? I mean, when we started as a company, like we have no production customers. Like now we have robots running autonomously twenty four seven on three different continents. Like so, like the data that we can generate is just at a completely different scale. Uh, and then the last one is the field has also moved a lot. Uh, very quickly, right? Like, so if you think about like a lot of the really scale up transformer architectures, how do you do large scale training? How do you do uh, image generation by diffusion? Like a lot of things have happened in the last couple of years that also enable us to build more sophisticated foundation models and world models, right? Because I think the key thing to recognize is that a lot of these ideas that we are talking about, like whether it's foundation model or world models, um, they have many different levels of potential expressivity, right? Like, so like, for example, like the most um, rudimentary form of role model might only be able to um, allow you to predict whether I have um, successfully grasped on a certain item or not. Like that is also a role model, like, but it's just a role model that's restricted to understanding like, like whether I have successfully grasped an item. Right? A much more expressive form of role model could be, well, if I have a cylindrical object in front of me and if I push it a little bit, like it would roll around and if it's like on a slanted surface in my roll back, like that is a much more sophisticated kind of role model compared to like a role model that is only tailor specific to one like small use case. Right? So I would say like because of the three forces that have happened, like the more compute that is available, the more data that is being generated by our production fleet, and the AI fields advances have together allow us to build progressively more powerful foundation models. Uh, and part of that would be the world model. Um, and these progressively more powerful models can allow existing applications to perform better, but also open up the possibilities for newer type of applications. Um, so I would say like in the world of building foundation models for robotics, we are seeing a very similar trend to what we are seeing in the large language model worlds. Like you look at the difference between GPT-2 to GPT-3 to GPT-4, there are remarkable differences, right? Like as you scale yeah. up compute, data, techniques, and you get greater capabilities out of it. Like even though like you can argue they are all the same idea of transformer plus next token prediction. But as you like as you do those things, like you get qualitatively different results and it enable orders of magnitude more applications. Yeah. Uh the covariance uh, robots uh, even though they're different form factors uh operate in controlled environments, relatively controlled environments and the a degree of uh, randomness or unpredictability is is uh, within a fairly narrow margin. <clears throat> How long do you think before uh, a world model 
controlling a robot or a foundation model, it wouldn't only be a world model, uh, can really operate in a real world environment, unstructured, uncontrolled? It's a really good question. Um, I wouldn't call the current environment fully structured, like the robots, like where the robots are operating in, right? If you think about all the objects that we see and manipulate with in our day-to-day -day life, like they go through a warehouse at some point, right? So like if mm. the covariant brain powered, like how we call our foundation model, the covariant brain, brain powered robots are operating in all warehouses, like it's building a pretty sophisticated understanding of like how you manipulate things, like even in the um, fully unstructured world. Um, but I think maybe the question is getting more at um, when can we have robots that move around and, and are like kind of fully in the wild as opposed to in like confined space in industrial processes that are high volume. Um, I think that mostly is going to become a hardware question as opposed to an AI question. Like I actually believe hardware is going to be the long pole in the tent as opposed to whether you can build um, um, the AI layer that can like navigate in a uh, less structured world freely. Um, so like there are a lot of companies and efforts working on this, like humanoid robots, like maybe humanoid with wheels, maybe humanoid with legs, uh, or maybe different kinds of form factors that actually allow you to navigate freely in the space and also do useful things with it. Um, I think there are a lot of interesting hardware problems to be solved there. Yeah, uh, and and on the on the warehouse, uh, well, for example, on the on the hardware side, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, Wave AI. They've uh, the the car is a robot and mm -hmm. it's well refined. Uh, so, uh, how long do you think before a world models can be applied to autonomous vehicles? with such uh, success and and stability that we can use them uh, on on the roads today? Or is that really a regulatory issue? I think this question is much better answered by like the self-driving car experts um, because they know the need <laughs> Okay, well, let me ask a, let me ask a warehouse question. And I know we're coming up to the end of the hour, but uh, uh, I remember when when I first met you guys and we were talking about the advantage of ro warehouse, uh, automated warehouses. And one thing that kind of fascinated me is, you know, as you said, they operate 24-7. They can operate in low light environments. Uh, they don't need, uh, you know, the air quality that humans need. Uh, I mean, do you have a vision for, and as you said, almost every object that we touch has come through a warehouse. Uh, do you have a vision for warehouses of the future that maybe will be these vast underground spaces uh, that, that where robots are working tirelessly in the dark and a human only has to go down periodically when there's some glitch or, or, you know, some hardware problem. Yeah. I mean, like, I think, I think it's more going to be a continuum. Like it's not going to be like fully lights out. Like, and what is the extreme of that? Like the extreme of that is you can think about like the, the whole moon is colonized by robots and like there's no human being on it, but it's just, there's a space factory there that just like keep pumping out goods and they, like it, they get sent to the earth autonomously right i mean that's one end of the extreme right it's like truly truly lights out like no human touch point i think that's like pretty far away uh i, I think we, ultimately we will get there but like what we believe it's more it's a more gradual adoption uh and you can already start adopting this type of technology today uh and in a for a long time like this form of technology would be uh adopted in the form of human augmentation, right? Like as opposed to like, I have to stand there and pump out 500 units of goods a day. I can now supervise 10 robots like that are, that are producing 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 units of goods today. And I have a much more 
engaging job of well, I'm actually overseeing ten robots and like looking at where they get stuck. Like, how can I arrange the in-stream, um, the, the upstream goods coming in, um, organize it in a way that allow me to get more output out of this fleet of robots, um, and figuring out like how can I, um, um, like unblock the robots as quickly as possible, as opposed to just doing the same motion again and again, like eight hours um, a day. And like this form of augmentation we see as a way to solve the labor challenges that our customers have. Like, so it, it allows mm -hmm. them to do much more with a much smaller pool of labor, as well as have a much better human experience for people that are working in this mm -hmm. vitally important um, societal infrastructure. Like, like now you actually have a job that is a lot more fun, engaging, and also way more productive um, um, than before. Uh, and over time, like as the technology becomes better, like you can see that ratio like uh, keeps improving. Like maybe like now it's like one person overseeing a fleet of ten robots. In the future, it would be fifty, a hundred. Like at some point, like you would have like whole factory of robots, and maybe just like one person walking around in it. Uh, and maybe at some point in the future, like we would get to that. Oh, like there's like two billion space factories on the moon, and like no one needs to touch that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'd, let me ask one more question because when we first uh, were talking uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was a, a, a lot. That I I don't know whether it was you or or one of your partners. Uh, I had asked uh, whether uh, robots could operate uh, a chicken uh, processing factory. I mean, certainly there are some there is some automation there but there was so much uh death from covid in these uh on these production lines uh it, it, but the the hardware wasn't versatile enough at that point to be able to deal with something as as soft and and uh floppy as a chicken carcass is that are we on the road to that? And then my final, final question is, do you feel you talked about a continuum? Are, are we close to a step change in robotics or are we still on uh, just a, a pretty steady incline? So I don't actually have context on the chicken processing uh, uh, question. So I would maybe not answer that specifically, but on the idea of, are we making progress on manipulating more dexterous objects, like manipulating deformable objects in a more dexterous ways? The answer is definitely yes, right? So when we look at uh, our systems and the capabilities that they have, like it's definitely understanding the physical world in more and more nuanced way and in a more and more expressive way. Uh, and so like where we are on a way there. And then in terms of the questions of um, whether we see a step change in robotics, um, I would say the most honest answer is we don't fully know. Like there are some forces that are working for it, and then there are some forces that are working against it. So let me tell you the forces that are working for the huge inflection acceleration. Like the, the forces that are working for it is we are getting to the point that you can really scale up compute and data to train really large robotic foundation models. Like and we have seen this kind of step change, like this phase transition of capabilities in the language world as you scale to a certain size of model, compute, and data. And we expect the same thing to happen, right? Like we expect like the foundation models that power these robots to get significantly smarter, to get significantly more general. Like, I mean, I cannot comment on what would happen outside of covariant, but at least at covariant, like we are seeing that coming. Like how do you scale up data, compute um, uh, model size significantly to get much smarter model? Um, the forces that are working against it is um, the adoption still needs to go through hardware and it still needs to go through an enterprise uh, adoption process. Like this is not like chat GPT that you can like largely turn on the faucet and or maybe not turn on the faucet, but like go to a, go to a website and then you can use it. Like, so like the adoption process would be slower, but I would say in terms of the capability leapfrog, um, like 
we think we are very close um, to a very clear um, phase transition. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash I on AI. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. Oracle.com slash I on AI. That's oracle.com slash I on AI. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Peter for his time. If you want to read a transcript of the conversation today, you can find one on our website, eye-on.ai. And remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is already changing your world. So pay attention. <laughs>